pray first. Father, we just thank you for this time. We just ask, Lord, that you just speak to our hearts. Encourage us by your word tonight, O oh God, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Well, this morning, Pastor James spoke about how important we are to God. You know, and uh, do we believe that? Do each, do each one of us here believe that we are important to Father God? Because sometimes a lot of people, although they have heard it said so many times and preached so many times, they still have a hard time of feeling worthy of the love of God. It's like they feel that they need to earn the love of God. You know, what we need to do is just to accept the love of God, you know? So tonight, what I'm going to share is about what is your worth? What is your worth, Pat? What is your worth? Sue, Susie, Susie. There's two Sue, square root. <laughs> Hallelujah. But let's look at a couple of scriptures, and I would like to start with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And this is what it says, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Now this means a couple of things, you know. You and I are special. We are unique. This means we are unique. This means also that we are remarkable. Can you look at the person beside you and say, remarkable? Remarkable, yes. You are a remarkable creation of God. We might not feel remarkable at times. We don't look, we, in our own eyes, we don't look remarkable but we are remarkable creation of God. We are valuable. Remember what pastor said this morning that when God created everything, first, second, third, fourth, fifth day, and God said, it was good, it is good, right? But on the sixth day, that was the only time he said, it's very good. I wonder what he made on the sixth day. He made us, and that was the only time he said, it's very good, amen? You know, we just came back from a vacation. We took a cruise, and there was an auction in the cruise. There was an auction in the cruise. Every day, they were auctioning artwork by different artists. And I thought, a lot of those people were paying a lot for the artwork. Like one would pay 13000 for an artwork. One would pay 4000 for two artwork because sometimes they would pair off an artwork or sometimes they would group them together, five, and they would do a special and it would be for a couple hundred dollars. You know, and I thought those people were paying a lot for those artwork. But then, but then I know I have very limited understanding about art. I don't know the painter. The only one that I heard that was familiar to me was Thomas Kincaid. You know, and we know he's an excellent, excellent, artists, but I don't know most of the artists. I don't know the type, type of art that they use, what kind of material, style, and all that. So therefore, I am a poor judge of really the true value of the artwork. I'm not the best person to, to I could judge that in my own understanding that's too much, you know? So if I would ask you something, how much would you pay for a used toothbrush? A dollar? Nothing. It's not worth anything, right? Even if it is just say use once, would you buy a used a toothbrush used once for a dollar for fifty cents? Nothing. Nothing. I understand. But what if the toothbrush was once owned by Napoleon? How much would you be willing to pay for that toothbrush? <laughs> Still nothing. You know what? One of his toothbrush sold for $21,000. A used toothbrush of Napoleon. How about, how about a, fake, a fake set of pearls? $10, $20? A fake set. 
Are you willing to pay $100? I, I see heads doing this, no? But what if I tell you that there was such a, a, such a, 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 a set of pearls that was owned by Jackie Onassis Kennedy, and how much do you think he, people paid for the fake pearls of hers? They paid over, a little over 200,000. Over 200,000. How about, a, 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 how, would you, how much would you pay for a, a piece of shit music, you know, for a song that you could play on the piano? There was one that was, in 2003, an original autograph piece of music was, by Beethoven, went for 1.5 million. I should be starting to write songs now. We should start writing songs now. We don't know many, how many, how much it would uh, sell a couple of years ago. Now, looking back to all those examples that I said, the toothbrush was used, the pearls were fake, and the music sheet was just a piece of paper. They weren't really valuable because of what they were, right? But the reason why they were valuable is because of who owned them. They were only valuable because of who owned them. If it was not Napoleon, it was not Jackie Onassis, if it was not Beethoven, it will not fetch for that much amount of money because they were popular. Now, the Bible says the same thing about us, about you and me here. We have value only because of who owns us. Amen? Because God has made us according to his own image. So even though you don't think you are valuable, if God owns you, you are a priceless treasure and possession. Now, several years ago, let me tell you a little illustration used by Max Locato. Several years ago, there was a couple of guys who broke into a department store in a big city. So they successfully entered the store, they stayed long enough to do, to do what they came to do, and then they escaped without, even, without anybody noticing them. Now what is unusual about the story is that these guys, what these, what these guys did, they took nothing. They took nothing, absolutely nothing. They did not take one item from the, grocery, uh, from the department store. There was no merchandise that was stolen. No items was removed. But they did something crazy. You know what they did? Instead of stealing anything, they changed the cost of everything in the department store. They switched price tags. They swapped all the price tags. Like there was one item, the guys took off a tag of a 390, 395 camera and put a $5 price tag on it. And then they took a $5.95 sticker off a paperback book and put it on an outboard motor. So they just swapped all these prices, okay? And then they went around doing this all throughout the store and then they left. Now, the following day, the store opened, all the employees showed up, and of course, customers starts to come. For four hours, people were crazily buying things, you know, like for a deal or either, either it's hilariously cheap or too expensive. So it took the management four hours to notice what happened how, what happened. And so there was a lot of confusion in the store. Imagine paying $5.95 for an outward motor. I would buy two, yes? Now, well, <coughs> so everything, the value of the, the items in the store got messed up. But just like that, that confusion and that, that chaos that happened in the department store, someone, snuck into our world, into the human race, stayed long enough to accomplish what he came to do and left a notice. And what they came to do was they switched the price tags on the value and the worth of people. So each time the people look at the mirror, what they see is a spam, which I love to eat, rather than a T-bone steak. I didn't know that spam was not too popular here that it was like the last thing you will buy if, but I do love it, I love the spam. 
But you know, somebody snuck into this world that, that, that confused our image of ourselves, that each time we look at the mirror, we're not seeing, this is just an, um, a, an example, comparison. Instead of seeing a T-bone steak that is expensive, that is wonderful, all we see is a spam. Now, remember John 10.10 10, that our enemy comes, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that is one of his mission, that he would steal our identity, that he would al allow us to live in a lie so that we will not live in the fullness of what we can have in Christ Jesus. Amen? Now, there was a, a, a heavily booked commercial flight in Denver. The flight was canceled, and so everybody was trying to rebook a flight. So it was a total chaos as well in the airport. Now, suddenly, an angry passenger pushed his way into the counter, ticket counter, and said, I have to be on this next flight, and it has to be first class. I'm sorry, sir, the, the agent said. I would be happy to help you, but I have to, to take care of all these other folks. Of course, the, the passenger was not listening at all. Do you have any idea who I am? Do you have any idea who I am? He demanded in a voice loud enough that everybody around him could, could hear. Without hesitating, the agent smiled and picked up a public address microphone and said, May I have your attention, please? She broadcast through the microphone. We have a passenger here at the gate who does not know who he is. If anyone can please help him find his identity, please come to the gate. Of course, the man was embarrassed, and he just slowly, slowly walked away quietly in the sight, you know. So this is sometimes one of our problems, you know. Some people think too highly of themselves. And because they, they feel that their identity and their worth is coming from maybe their money, their, their achievements, their beauty, their accomplishments. Maybe I would say, I would do a name drop and say, well, well I, I am a distant cousin of Bill Gates. Your name dropping, identification, what family you, you belong to. So, so these are false ideas of our identity. And a lot of people uh, also find their identity in what they do. Now, I do not say this, uh, you know, what we do gives us fulfillment, especially what we do, we enjoy doing. Like, I know Austin loves worship. I love worship. You might love other things. Sue loves the children. You have other passions. We each have here different passions in life, right? And, and, and for us, if we are doing what we are passionate about, we are happy, we are content, right? We are con happy and content. But it, it, it would be wrong if we build our whole identity on what we do, because we are more than that. We are more than that, okay? Just like this girl. John Ortberg tells of a story about his daughter. John Ortberg is a writer. He wrote books like, if you want to walk on water, what do you have to do? Get out of the boat. So he wrote a lot of these books, OK? So he was talking, he tells about the story about his daughter who moved to a new school while he was, she was about sixth grade, OK? So the first day of school was very traumatic to the young girl because of the, the newness, the newness of the environment. Everything was new, all the people around her was new. And it, she was ha having a, a difficulty dis establishing friendship, relationship with the people around her. So that night, as John put his daughter to bed, he asked her how she felt. And she said this, I felt like a little mouse without a hole. I felt like a little mouse without a hole. Sometimes in our lives, we can identify this, with this feeling, right? Because it seems like we desperately want to fit in, and yet we're not fitting in. We're not finding that place. So we want to have a place where we belong. Like Wilma was telling me, uh, one of the ladies in our church was telling me how she had a wonderful time yesterday when the, 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 uh, some people in the church gathered together for, for a meal, for fellowship. Because uh, 
uh, as, um, as observed in other situations and other uh, groups, uh, sometimes married couples will not welcome somebody who's single for fellowship. And that is sad, you know, and that is sad because we should look at it as we are a family where each one has a place that they could, that they, they would feel they are wanted, that they, are, that they, they, are, that they belong. Now, uh, a few years ago, have you heard of the song group Casting Crowns, right? And Chris, I know, has uh, 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 used this song when he leads worship, the song, Who Am I? And this is one of the, the, some of the wordings in this song. And Mark Hall, the singer, the lead singer, said this one. This is the, 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 the lyrics of the song. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name? would care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave toast in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling. You catch, you catch me when I'm falling. And you tell me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. What a beautiful love song from God the Father. You know, that he has placed his seal of ownership upon each one of us. I don't know. We each grew up differently. I know that some people probably lost the parent early in life and maybe was an orphan most of his childhood. I don't know if you feel you've been rejected by your siblings, by a spouse, by a parent, by a teacher. You know, we go through different circumstances in our life and we feel rejected, we feel hurt, we feel uh, underprivileged, we feel that we've been denied certain things in life. You know, we've been misunderstood. But just listening to the song, I think he put, put, you know, God says, I am yours. You are mine. You are mine. You are mine. You are mine. So the message of the song is that no matter how small sometimes we, we feel, because maybe we feel we failed, maybe we feel we, uh, you know, we, we, we're, we're not thriving in life, so the message of the song is that no matter how small or insignificant we may feel, the Lord of all the earth, the Lord who made all the galaxies, the universe, and all these things, this awesome vastness in the, in the world, you know, he, he not only says, you are mine, you are mine, but he knows our name. He knows our hurt. He knows our struggles. He knows the pain that we feel. But he also knows that there is redemption in him. Amen? Now, a long, long time ago, another great songwriter, King David, wrote a similar hymn. And uh, let me just read it to you. Psalms 8, verses 1 to 9. And uh, this is quite an amazing scripture. And this is what King David wrote. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, ha, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Remember, when God created everything in this earth, he said, they are good. But when he created you, he said, ha, this is very good. This is very good. Now, have you ever been told what you were worth. 
I know growing up, I, I've heard it so many times from so many people that they grew up hearing phrases like, you ain't worth a dime, or you ain't worth nothing, or you won't amount to anything, or something similar to that, you know? Now, I looked this up. There is a phrase that says, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. Do you think that's true? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never harm me. Now, once we say something, it's, we cannot recapture it. Once we release it, maybe in a moment of anger, in a moment of frustration, you know, we cannot recapture those words anymore. But we know that words, this, this phrase here, this, this is not quite true, you know, although it's very popular because words can hurt the soul. Now, Proverbs 12, 18, what does Proverbs 12, 18 says? Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You know, words can cut like a knife through our soul and leave a scar for a lifetime. When those words come from people like people that we love, people that we respect, that people that should, are supposed to take care of us and build us up, so people are supposed to watch out for us, you know? Parents, siblings, you know, spouses, and others that are close to us. Now, those words can be extremely da damaging, and it can cause a lifetime of pain, a lifetime of pain and brokenness in relationship. Now, the enemy would like for us to dwell on those hurts and pains. The enemy would like for us to be bound by our past, by all our, our past disappointments and hurts. The enemy wants us to be stuck where we are. That's his, that's his, that his, that is his work. He doesn't want us to discover who we are in Christ. He doesn't want us to discover that there's more in life in Christ. Now, there was an old, there was a story about a fellow who bought an old organ, which had been magnificent during the best of its days. But now it's just old, dilapidated, banged up, hardly played anymore because it's not working properly. So this man has the ability to call in expert. He has the money. So he called in experts from all over the world, hoping that they could restore the old organ. So when they had finished, Restoring the organ, it looks fantastic. You know, the little angels decorating the organ were shiny and clean. The ornamental carved leaves are back to how it should be. The varnish was fine. It was so nice. It really looks so very beautiful. But the, there was a problem, and the only problem was that the insides were sitting in boxes on the floor. So the outside looks beautiful. Looks like it's expensive, but the inside still has problems. So the owner continued to make search for somebody who could really fix the organ, restore the organ, but nobody all over the world could do it. Nobody, even if he offered much money to pay, nobody could be able to restore the old organ. Now one day, a little bit drab-looking, half-blind man came knocking on the door. And then the butler opened the door, kind of laughed at the old man just because of the, the way he looked. What makes you think you can fix it? You can fix the organ. We've had experts all over the world. But the owner overheard the discussion between the old man and the butler and said that, well, it wouldn't hurt if he could, you know, try try his hands on the, the organ. So this stranger set out to work. After several, day, several days, the owner ha ha heard the organ playing, creating wonderful music. And so he asked the old man, what did you, how could you do this? And he said, this is what he said, I made it. I made the organ. As the maker of the organ could fix and restore 
and give new life to the organ because he made it. So, the, the God of the universe, God too, who made each one of us, is truly the only one who could fix, who could restore, and give new life and direction to each one of us. It doesn't matter how low in the dumps we feel. It doesn't matter how bad we mess up. It doesn't matter. I, it doesn't matter. God made us, and he is the one who could fix us. He is the one who could fix us. Sunday morning, last Sunday, Chris showed a video, right, about the feather. Do you remember last Sunday about the Chinese girl who was doing all this acrobatic dance with all kinds of palm branches dried up and how everything just stayed in the air and in one corner of this whole dance there was a leaf there, no there was a feather there was a feather and everything was amazing until the feather was removed now in our life we try to balance so many things right being of being a dad, being a businessman, being a, all these things, everything, everything. Because we have different roles. We perform different roles in our lives. But if we remove the one thing that can keep the balance in our life, and we know who that is, that is God. If we remove him as being numero uno, number one priority, all these things will just start to shh fall down, you know? It will just, everything will just be chaos all around us. So the God of the universe is the only one who could really truly fix us. And let me read to you a couple of scriptures here. Jeremiah 1.5, what does it say? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nation. How about Luke 12, 7? Jesus said, and the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to him than a whole flock of sparrows. If God knows the number of our hairs, not just the number of hairs, but what specific hair was curled or was colored or highlighted, you know, he knows it very well. If he knows it, it means there is a, this is a deep expression of love because he's paying attention to us. And I know Pastor Jim would sometimes would tell me, you're not listening to me. You know, if I truly love him, I will listen to him when he's talking to me. And I need to be better in that because sometimes I'm distracted with a lot of things. And he just said one thing, oh, well, he will just say one thing and then maybe 10 minutes later, I will repeat the same thing. He said, I just said that to you. And it was like, oh, really? So paying attention is the deepest expression of love that we could give to somebody. So when you give somebody your attention, you're giving them your love. Okay? We got that, right? So God is always paying attention to us. Always. Always paying attention to our struggles, to our pains. You know? It's just a breath away. We could prayer away just a prayer away now chip ingram has anybody heard about chip ingram he's a bible teacher and he made this comment what you think about god shapes your whole relationship with him okay what you think about god shapes your whole relationship with him in addition what you believe god thinks about you determines how close you will grow toward him. If we keep reading the word of God and we keep reading, reading the word of God, where it's sometimes it's a, like, like the other Sunday, you know, where, when Margaret shared about um, the Song of Solomon, you know, the, or other parts of scripture when the word of God would tell us how much the Lord loves us, how much God the Father loves us, how much he, he cares for us, how, how important we are, that he dances over us with singing, he, singing, he rejoices over us. You know, but if you keep, you keep that we are his beloved, like the song this morning, we are his beloved, 
Now, if we keep repeating this and how, how we focus on what the Word of God says, how God perceives each one of us, you know, then pretty quickly the lies of the enemy, the things that we've been labeled growing up, people label us, you know, we get different labels in this life. Oh, oh he's a failure. Or, oh, he's a, he's a loser. Or, oh, he's a liar. Or, oh, he's a whatever not. You know, we got different labels. And so pretty soon, if we keep rehearsing what the devil is telling us, we, we believe the labels. We believe these labels. We believe that we're a failure, that we, we were, were that valuable, that we are unimportant, and all these things. But if we focus on what the Word of God says and what Papa God says about us, then we will start to negate all those negativity, all those negative words. Those are word curses, actually. We negate those, and life will start coming forth in our lives. And we start to have a new outlook in life. We start to feel good about ourselves because we know that the God of the universe loves me so much that he died for me. He loves me so much that he died for me. Okay? Now, just like the grade, the grade school teacher who noticed that one of his little pupil in her school was having a hard time reading the blackboard, just straining her eyes, she knew that the girl's family was very poor. So what did the teacher do? She took it upon herself to have the girl's eye examined, and sure enough, this girl needed glasses, and so the, the teacher, yes, said, go ahead, make the glasses, and she paid for the glasses. So the following week, the teacher was excited, came to the student and gave the student her new glasses. The girl looked at the glasses, but refused to take them, and she said that they're so poor that they could not afford to pay for the glasses. The teacher gave the glasses to her anyway and said, you don't have to pay for them. I already did. The same way that Jesus already paid it all. We see an empty cross, but that cross is costly because he died. He chose to die, to die for, for all, our, of, all of our sins, all of our failures, all of our limitations, all, everything, all of these things. He, he died that we may have life. Amen? We may have life. So... That way, all our, all our debts are canceled, and God is giving us a new slate. New slate. You know, there are many different, uh, well, uh, I have learned about many different approaches that people use uh, for, to, pray, uh, to address, like, for example, healing of the soul, healing of the emotion. There are many different ways that people address it, or make techniques, maybe that's the right way, techniques or methodology of how to address, you know, a wounded soul, a wounded heart. You know, the only thing that we need to do is deal with sin immediately in our lives. Turn around from sin, ask, repent of it, and then that is a clean slate right there. But then there's still the wounding of this heart and the soul. And Pastor and I were talking about this in the ship, that you know, really the greatest antidote the greatest thing for us, you know, to be healed in our emotion is just to fall in love with Jesus, to get as close as we can to Papa God, to Jesus, fall in love with him, develop that relationship, because we know that he would always breathe life into us. He would always speak life to us. So, you know, and as soon as, as, soon as we fall in love more and more with him, and then we know that he paid the price already, you know, those in wounded, those souls that are wounded, the emotions that are, that are wounded, the healing balm of Gilead will start to flow in. You know, it's just a wonderful feeling to know that you are loved, right? Do we agree? Yeah. It's just a wonderful feeling that you are loved. And how much more if we could just fix our eyes on the love of God the Father. Fix our eyes on the love of God the Father. Now, if you feel insignificant or small, 
Remember that you matter to God. Remember what he said, the song? You are mine. You are mine. Or we can say, I'm yours, Lord. I am yours. I belong to you. So the, 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 the Lord of all the earth knows your name, knows the, th the pains and the hurts that you're going through, and the bright and morning star wants to light the way for your ever-wandering heart. So our worth as a person does not come first on our work, our looks, our intelligence, our ministry, our relationships, our connections, our family name, our accomplishment, or what else. Yo, it first come if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think the most important thing for our life is to guard that relationship with, with him, with Jesus, and to grow in that relationship. And I know that many times in our lives, we have allowed other things to creep in to pull us away from him. But it's time to, get, to go into the love chamber once again, you know, and allow God to just minister his love to us in the same way we minister to him in love. So remember, the ultimate Measure of love is John 3, 16. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So if the devil starts telling lies on, on you that you are not important, that you have no value, you hush that voice immediately. Amen? Let's remember scriptures. Let's quote scriptures. And this is the only way we can silence the lies of the enemy. So can we turn to, to one another and say, you are worth more than gold. You are worth more than gold. You are worth more than gold. Amen?
doesn't come Seems like a thousand years have come and gone Can you find me in the dark Just listen for a crying heart I know On the wall, but there's no light. I hear voices all around, but I'm alone tonight. Oh, with a gentle touch, you hold me tight. When I am still, that is when you come to me.
So I 
I will lift my voice to you.